period of last six year to seven years because Twitter is all about real time. And uh, so I will share some of the few experiences that we had with streaming at large scale within Twitter context. Then uh, I will go some slides about how much resource and how costly is here and when you run it. And finally, I will conclude. So Twitter is all about real time, as I said earlier. First, there's a lot of real time trend computation because whenever you open up the Twitter app and you see the hashtag trends and all the events that are trending, all those things uh, bubble up. And it's all like because of the real time analytics that we do. And um, there's a lot of real time conversation during sporting events like Super Bowl or NFL or NBA games. A lot of conversation flows through Twitter saying that, hey, that stuff was awesome, you know. Oh, we could have done it this way for this play. Something, those kind of conversation uh, com keeps going, flowing in Twitter. And the third one is real time recommendations. Because uh, since our uh, 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 revenue is based on ad injection, how do you choose the right time to inject the right amount of ad? Um, and finally, real time search. Because Twitter is. Uh, known for search, where you go search.twitter.com, you might want to immediately bubble up those tweets that is entered the system within a few milliseconds, so that uh, as people come and search for some of the keywords, the relevant tweets, which are very real, re recent or real time, should bubble up right away. So this generates uh, billions and billions of events for us in real time. And it's challenging to manage those analytics and how to serve those analytics. And uh, so in order to uh, uh, what you call meet those challenges, Heron was designed from ground up uh, uh, at Twitter, and that's what I'll be talking about. So to, just to give a Heron terminology, some uh, color, like uh, a, a streaming a Heron job is called a topology, which is very similar to Storm. Uh, how many of you have heard about Storm itself? Oh, that's quite a few. So it's exactly like the Storm terminologies because uh, uh, we wanted to be backward compatible with Storm. And um, as I said, as storm terminology goes, topology is essentially a, nothing but a DAG, and there are two different type of vertices. And uh, so one of the vertices is called spouts, which uh, represents the data sources, where you can tap into data sources. And some of the data sources include uh, Kafka, Kestrel, even you can do MySQL, Postgres, or any other databases that you'd like to. And uh, some of the interesting data sources is Twitter itself. For example, within Twitter, we use the notion of a firehose where we get all the Twitter data that is uh, coming into the system, and uh, we have a spout that can govern or uh, that can read out of those. And uh, second type of vertices is called bowls that represents the actual computation, and they take the in uh, tuples that are incoming or entering the bowls, transform those uh, data in certain form, and emit our outgoing tuples if there are any. And some of the examples of uh, processing involve filtering. Either you filter the tuples or do some aggregations. Or you can even join across streams or join across a, a table or even a microservice join. And you could even do an arbitrary function like a machine learning function like either a, a clustering or a linear regression or association, those kind of uh, algorithms as well. So with that short introduction, let us see how a Heron topology looks like. So here you have a, a couple of spouts that's tapping into uh, data. Then they're feeding into the next stage bowls, like bowl one through bowl three. and um, then finally, like uh, those bowls transform the data in some form and uh, send it to the next stage bowls, which is essentially bowl four and bowl five. And as you can see, bowl four and uh, is receiving two streams, and they, it will be doing some kind of a, an operation that combines the two streams in some arbitrary way. So, why did we design Heron in the first place? So, see the, um, I mean, we wrote a paper on Heron, uh, which we published in Lost Sigmod. And uh, we, are, we outlined all the issues that uh, we encountered with Storm. There were totally around 19 issues that we figured out in Storm, which was causing or which was preventing it to run at a scale that we require. And, uh, but since we have already made a massive investments on the Storm API, uh, the applications or the analytics applications that we have returned using Storm, we cannot change it in one day. So instead, we took the approach where the Heron will be compatible with the API compatible with uh, Storm so that we can replace Storm under the covers with Heron without application or the analytics writers or the data scientists knowing about it, any changes that have happened underneath. So that is the reason why we just chose to uh, be backward compatible. So the second issue is like uh, task isolations. One of the biggest issues that we faced were with the Storm was is the threaded system. Because of the fact it was a threaded system, it is very difficult to uh, debug a bolt or a individual spout and see where the performance in the bolt and spout is going, and also like how to isolate. For example, when you say this bolt and this 
spout is going to take some X amount of CPU and Y amount of memory, how do you guarantee that it will take only that amount without exceeding? Because we were badly burnt in uh, production by running Storm where two topologies, if they are scheduled in, uh, or fragments of two topologies were scheduled in the same machine and each one was trampling one over the other and uh, it could lead to uh, performance unpredictability. And we used to fight with those kind of problems all the time. And every time some issues occur, it takes like minimum six to eight hours to identify what is the issue is. So because of that reason, task isolation become very important. Then finally, like uh, we decided to use some mainstream languages. How many of you know what languages was Storm was written in originally? Okay, it was written in a functional programming language called Clojure, which is a kind of a Lisp-like syntax which is a nice language from a functional standpoint, but uh, uh, training people on a new language becomes really hard and the kind of tools that you don't have when compared to the mainstream tools becomes an issue, which means the iteration of development is not as fast as I would like, we would like to be. So hence we chose to uh, write Heron in the uh, mainstream languages called C++, in C++ Java and Python. And uh, the reason why a lot of people question about why you choose C++, one of the thing is a streaming job is not a job that runs to termination. Instead, it's a job that is continuously running all the time. And uh, we wanted to minimize a lot of the, the GC effects that can happen because of the unpredictable data nature uh, and its arrival. And because of that reasons, there are some core components of the system that are written in C++, which is once it's debugged, it's running perfectly well. And uh, the parts of the uh, heron that is dealing with the user facing, that's all written in Java. And the tools are written in Python because it can iterate fast. So the Heron architecture, the first thing that uh, we chose in Heron is, unlike Storm was, Storm used to have a scheduler on its own. And we looked at uh, uh, several uh, communities, there are a lot of schedulers that are really matured and it's very reliable. For example, uh, take the case of Yawn and take the case of Mesos. And these are what we call as unmanaged schedulers. And there are managed schedulers that run on top of it, similarly what you call uh, Aurora, which is uh, runs on top of uh, Mesos which is allows you to do uh, long running services. And also there is something called uh, Marathon, which is again written on top of the uh, Mesos. Then um, Amazon has some, some term called ECS, which is easy to Docker container service, which is a ton of the scheduler. And um, similarly, Google has a Kubernetes. And uh, so with all the scheduler and they have their own community and uh, like having matured, so we said that uh, we don't want to write a ton of the scheduler, which is specific for the streaming system. Instead, we piggybacked on our uh, existing scheduler. So whenever you submit a Heron job, it's equivalent to submitting a, a, a turn of the job to a scheduler, and the scheduler will just find the resources and schedule it. So essentially here, you, when you submit a topology, it goes to a scheduler, whichever the scheduler you have configured Heron with, and uh, that runs the entire topologies as separate jobs. And the cool thing is, like, it is a multi-tenant, in the sense like, if your cluster is running Spark, or even a, we have another map to jobs, it just coexists with them seamlessly. And that's what we do inside uh, Twitter also. So to drill down a little bit further about how our uh, topology runs inside uh, uh, Heron when you schedule it, so there is a special container called, everything is uh, uh, scheduled in terms of containers, how many containers that you need and what resources that you need per container. So there is a special container called uh, container zero. That's the first thing that starts up. And that is called, uh, it in turn uh, starts a process called Topology Master. And Topology Master is uh, one manages the entire topology uh, during its life cycle. And uh, once the Topology Master comes up, it says uh, how many resources that it will uh, additionally that I will require in order to run the topology. So once it figures that out, then uh, the Topology Master contacts the scheduler. Hey, by the way, I need like uh, 100 containers and each container should be uh, worth like eight CPUs and uh, 10 GB of memory, can you please give me? So once the scheduler gives those containers, then um, those containers are scheduled uh, on those respective uh, nodes by the scheduler. And within those containers, the first thing that comes up is something called the stream manager. So the stream manager essentially is responsible for data routing between the containers so that the, a streaming job, which is pushing data from one spout to bolt and bolt to another bolt, all goes through the stream manager. So, so the, the, once the stream manager comes up, then the, all they look for is, hey, where is my topology master? And uh, they look up into the zookeeper because the topology master comes up and writes where it can be discovered into the zookeeper. Then the stream manager picks it up and uh, then contacts the uh, topology master. 
Once all the container stream managers are registered with the topology master, the topology master forms something called a physical plan. And uh, it writes a physical plan into the Zookeeper cluster. And that physical plan it essentially constitutes how, how the containers can communicate with each other. For example, how do I know the, the one on the right hand side stream manager is running on host A on port B? So this stream manager has to know, the one on the container on the left side has to know about it. So then only they can connect and exchange data, right? So that's what physical plan is all about. So once a physical plan uh, is stored into Zookeeper, that physical plan is pushed out to the, all the stream managers in all the container, then they can discover each other. Once they discover each other, then they connect and become a fully connected graph, then automatically this data flow starts going through. And uh, this is the short introduction about the Heron architecture. So if you look at it, as I said, like uh, if they have four containers, then you have this uh, notion of the fully connected graph where every stream managers have to discover each other using the physical plan, then they will start uh, exchanging data. And as you can see, each container has uh, three instances. So there's a one market difference between Storm and Heron is, uh, the Heron runs as uh, indi the individual spout and bolt uh, instances uh, runs as an individual process. Remember the uh, topology that I showed, like spout and bolt in the earlier. Each of them runs in an individual process as compared to threads in a storm context. And because of the process environment, you can get a logs quickly about that particular process, what is it doing, and you can heap dump, do a, a, what you call a J stack, all kind of stuff with it, so that you can identify any performance related issues quickly. And uh, such a, a connectivity also using the stream manager allows you to reduce the number of sockets and the ports from order of n square to order of k square, where k is the number of containers and n is the number of instances. If you have to, if you have to remove the stream manager and uh, how to connect all the spouts to bowls, you will need n square sockets. And the sockets uh, and the corresponding ports, you can't scale. Think about like uh, having uh, uh, like around uh, 800 to 1000 containers, which is normal that we do at uh, Twitter. And when you do 800 to 1000 containers, then you look at 800 square. So that many number of ports and number of sockets that you need. So that's a precious commodity. We wanted to save it so that we can scale further. So, so the Heron is completely running in production. All the real-time analytics and everything runs in Heron completely. And some of the sample topologies include simple to complex topologies. As you can see, wide varieties of topologies that are running. For example, the first one is a very simple one. And the last one, as you can see, how many spouts and bowls and components are involved. Even though it's only one spout, look at the number of bowls that is. Uh, gets uh, instantiated because of the nature of the processing logic itself. And um, as you can see, like uh, such DAGs are very complex to schedule and uh, figure out how much resources that you need. Once you figure out those resources and scheduling, and it has been running perfectly well. And uh, one of the incidents, like uh, one, so at uh, ESP, I mean, I couldn't give the numbers, but uh, one thing that I can share with you is like, uh, once Heron went into production, So we got a 10x uh, reduction in number of the incidents. So like uh, the pager duty that we have to carry got, got reduced by 10x. So which means like a good night's sleep for us as a team because the massive uh, 30 or 40 teams in Twitter keep running a lot of real-time analytic jobs on top of our uh, framework. And uh, because of that, it has to be highly reliable. And uh, if any issues occur, because some of the revenue generating jobs also run on top of it, we have to attend to it. And uh, with the uh, storm, and uh, we got to wake up at uh, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 4 a.m. So now, after this went into production, we had a good night's sleep. So then um, another number that I can share with you is uh, that uh, Heron uh, is pretty fast in terms of throughput as well as low latency. And uh, that also, it, it achieves those things with the reduced number of hardware. So we uh, saw around 2x to 5x reduction in the hardware because that is substantial for us, especially when you're running on a few thousand nodes, right? That is substantial for us. So that is the amount of uh, 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 winnings that we got because of Heron. Uh, so finally, like Heron is being used in uh, several cases uh, on his uh, uh, real-time ETL and real-time BI. These are the use cases, broad use cases that we do within Twitter. And the real-time BI is essentially like computing these multiple cubes on the fly as the data is just transmitting or the streaming, right? And product safety, like spam, spam, and uh, intuition detection, as well as abuse, all these things is run on top of uh, uh, Heron as well. 
Then real-time trends, as I mentioned earlier, it's also computed on top of uh, Heron. And uh, we also do real-time machine learning too, like where you do some of the classification and model building, model enhancements, all of them run Heron as well. And uh, some of the image classification features, those are also run on top of Heron. And finally, real-time ops, like uh, since Twitter has uh, hundreds and thousands of machines, all the data coming from those machines are fed through several Heron topologies to identify when is the machine going to fail or the machine is going to run running slow then it's uh, other peers all those analytics are also on top of Heron too. So now I'm going to uh, zoom in on a couple of uh, the issues that uh, we designed how we design Heron and what are the problems that we faced in practice. So one of the uh, mm, thing is the big data uh, ecosystem is continuously changing because suddenly some new software comes up and uh, then you have to adopt to it. So those kind of things are always uh, keep changing, especially in the open source environment, right? So as you can see, like uh, there is schedulers like uh, Yawn and Mesos, and similarly the managed schedulers Aurora, K Kubernetes, ECS, and uh, uh, Amazon EC, uh, that is Marathon. Then similarly, like uh, the state managers, which we call like uh, where you synchronize your distributed state, those are all like Zookeeper, even local file system, Hadoop, those kind of things keep coming up. And again, like uh, when you wanted to upload your job, you need a distributed uh, storage system as well. And that also is either in the form of Hadoop or even S3 and even uh, uh, what you call uh, some kind of a database or even a web. So a lot of these things uh, come and go as we talk about. But we want the core to be remaining always. So how do you survive in this environment? So what we did is like uh, we looked back and um, because one of the theses that I always have is in computer science, a lot of these infrastructure related architecture or terminologies keep revisiting back every 20 to 30 years. So when I looked back how we can uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, survive in this environment, so we looked back some of the things called microkernels. How many of you have heard about microkernels in the context of uh, awesome? So the one of the first microkernels that came into play was a mock system from CME, right? And uh, they thought like uh, the kernel is too massive and instead of uh, doing all of these uh, hardware, device drivers, uh, scheduler and virtual memory and everything, so instead they kept only the core, which is essentially la the basic IPC layer and the scheduling. That is the only thing that you need. The rest of them other can be punted out to application layer so that they, they can run as an application process. So we borrowed this idea and essentially we moved the terminology into something called a micro stream engine where the Heron uses is, com Heron is completely comprehensive. You can replace anything at any time you want. So the key thing that you need is a basic infrastructure uh, IPC, uh, which is running on top of a hardware. That hardware could be even um, uh, like um, gigabit ethernet or even for, uh, 40 gigabit, 100 gigabit ethernet, or you can even do InfiniBand, those kind of things where which hardware which provides low latencies. And uh, some of the APIs that it needs is schedulers and the state managers. So we call them SPIs because this is essentially a service provider interface. And those service provider interfaces allows you to uh, talk to any kind of state managers. So essentially, if you take the example of a topology master, and it talks to the state manager and uh, basic IPC and the scheduler, that's it. And as long as the, the connected lines, are, there is a well-established protocol. And once you start, uh, write this protocol, you can replace the stream manager. Like I want, today, I want to write a stream manager which will talk only with uh, uh, one of the infinity band. So for low latency, yes, you can take out the stream manager, push your stream manager in. And similarly, the instance, for example, one of the things that we are doing with the instance is, the instance is nothing but your spout and the bolt code, which is essentially your programs. And we are currently working on a, a Python version of the API. And in order for the Python version of the API and the, or run the Python code, we want to run in the native Python interpreter. And uh, so now uh, the instance that we have written is written in Java, because that is for Java facing user programs for users. And uh, all we have to do is for Python is write the Python native instance, plug that in, then Java programs and Python programs can co coexist, or the topologies can coexist. And similarly, the metrics manager, again, that is abstracted out so that you can talk to even graphite, scribe, you can write your own metrics things to your custom observability stack that you would like to. So, so this advantage is like a plug and play components, as environment changes, code does not change. and. Uh, Multi-language instance, as I said, Python, uh, uh, C++, and uh, Java-related instances can be re returned quickly. And you can have support multiple processing semantics like efficient stream managers. And finally, it's ease of development. We can go pretty fast, especially when there are multiple groups doing, thing, uh, doing multiple things. They can just 
focus only on their component and without having to worry about the interaction with the other things and they can move, iterate fast enough. So finally, the Heron has been running on several different environments. One is uh, uh, we have this notion of a local scheduler where you can bring entire Heron and its corresponding topologies on a single laptop. It runs as though it's running on a distributed cluster with uh, multiple processes and everything. And uh, we use the local state manager for synchronization, which uses a local file system. And the local uploader is whenever you submit your topology code, we have to upload that so that the scheduler can pick it up and run it. That also we use a local file system. And this is our primary development and iterating environment. And uh, we have a MISO scheduler, uh, which is running inside Twitter. And uh, the actual product, the, then you use the Zookeeper as a state manager for distributed synchronization. We use HTFS for the uploading of the jobs, so that the, the job uh, near code is available across all the machines uh, in the wherever it's scheduled to be run. And that is used for testing purposes. And uh, Aurora scheduler is where we actually run all the production. And it also uses the Zookeeper as state manager and the Packer uploader. Packer uploader allows you to do a versioning and maintenance of the jobs. For example, when you write a, a topology, and people often do bug fixes and keep moving the topologies, right? And sometimes what happens is when you push some topology into production and suddenly something happened because you uh, introduced a bug or whatever, then you quickly want to roll back into the older one, right? So the packer maintains those uh, versions of those things, older versions of the jar, so that you can quickly cut it over without having to do a lot of downtime. And this is what runs in cluster and production. And uh, we have a experimental Yarn version of the schedule already available in the open source. Uh, if you're interested in Yarn, you can try it out. And that was uh, contributed by Microsoft. And um, finally, like I'm going to uh, zoom in on one of the additional problems that we face, which is called in stragglers. And uh, the stragglers essentially is uh, uh, guys who are going slow in the system. And uh, it's kind of a stragglers are a norm in a multi-tenant database uh, distributed system. And uh, there are three re primary reasons why the stragglers occur in these large distributed systems. One is bad host, and uh, it's not a, the host is dead. If the host is dead, we are very clear, because automatically the fragment of the jobs and the containers that are running on those uh, hosts will automatically get migrated uh, without um, any manual intervention. But if the bad host is essentially like, it's running, and it's not dead, but it's slow, because either some memory errors have occurred or some disk errors have occurred, but until you really figure out what's really going on, you can't identify that. As when a streaming job runs, it keeps running, and it figures out I'm not able to run as fast as I can. So how do you deal with it? So then uh, second aspect is execution skew, where uh, a particular hot key, which is hitting one of the nodes, or one of the process in that node, it will be probably more than whatever that process can handle. So that is an execution skew. And uh, the third one is, you might not have provided enough resources so that your input data rate as well as the processing data is not matched. So th those are the three primary reasons why stragglers or uh, uh, back pressure can occur. So in order to uh, handle this, we have three approaches. One is uh, uh, senders to stragglers uh, drop the data. So if you are sending data to a straggler, hey, by the way, that guy is not uh, absorbing the data as fast as I am sending, so I'll just drop it. So simply drop it. So the second aspect is to the sender slow down to the speed of whatever the uh, receiver is going at. And this is a very classic, uh, uh, similar to TCP like IP like protocol, where uh, you have senders and receivers until they figure out uh, a certain uh, uh, window, uh, they try to negotiate, and finally they settle on a particular window size so that their uh, sender is transmitting at the rate at which the receiver is receiving. Then finally, like uh, uh, detect trackless and reschedule them. So these are the three approaches. And uh, if you look at the first approach, the drop data strategy, uh, is very unpredictable because, especially in a large uh, job, you don't know who is dropping and what is being dropped. And, uh, and because of that, uh, accuracy gets affected. And uh, all you know is accuracy is getting affected. How do you know which guy is, getting the, is facing that issue and actually what is the underlying issue? Then, uh, so that's what the poor visibility is. Then finally, like uh, the second one is a slow down sender strategy. So this happens like uh, it provides productivity. So when the machine recovers because of other reason, then process can resume at a faster rate and also reduces recovery times because whenever you uh, are not going as fast as whatever the data input arrival is, the data is accumulating. By the time again it picks up speed, 
then you can process it at a very fast rate. And it can handle spikes very well. As you all know, Twitter's data is very spiky because uh, whenever a touchdown occurs, boom, it will go 3x, 4x. And uh, during Japanese New Year, like 10x uh, spike. Like, uh, that, uh, and there was uh, one of the incident was like, um, there was a Japanese cotton, cotton movie that was being screened. And uh, in one of those, the one of the characters is very popular. And uh, when that character utters a particular word in uh, one segment of the movie, everybody simultaneously tweets. That is like a 14x <laughs> spike that you will see. <laughs> so, so, so uh, the, that uh, slowdown and center strategy works at the pace of what others can absorb. So to give an example, let's take this simple linear topology where S1, B2 uh, gives the data to B2, B2 is uh, bolts, and the B3 uh, gets the data from B2, then it forwards to B4. Uh, so when you look at uh, uh, these containers, then uh, let's say, for example, the B2, one of the B2 is running slow, then uh, what happens is the stream manager that's in that container will know oh, the B2 is going slow. Then, uh, so immediately it will send a back pressure message, hey, by the way, one of my guys is going slow, can you release this data that you are sending to me? So that is the green arrow that message is sent. And uh, so who is the source of all the data? Spouts. So then once the stream manager receives this message, what they do is like uh, they look at all the spouts in the containers and uh, kind of clamp them down, saying that, hey, by the way, spouts, please don't emit any more data because some data is not going as fast as I would like to. So, like, uh, so that has the effect of slowing down the whole topology. Then. Uh, then once uh, the back pressure is relieved and the B2 is absorbing data as fast as it could, then we again send a relief back pressure messages, then the spouts gates are open. Again, the data is coming through at a faster rate. So this could get into some kind of a spiky behavior. And uh, because uh, and in order to avoid the spiky behavior, we have these buffers in the stream manager that allows you to, what do you call, uh, uh, cushion that so that you have a low watermark and high watermark where anything glow goes low watermark, your back pressure is relieved. When anything goes beyond uh, high watermark, your back pressure is initiated. That kind of allows you to kind of uh, smoothen that spiky behavior. So um, that seems to work well in practice. That's what we put in production. And uh, so if I, um, one of the uh, uh, thing in the back pressure that you have to notice is, yeah. so one of the things that back pressure notice is like uh, you have this, uh, uh, if back pressure occurs, everything is going to the source, then there is a difference in uh, terms of write pointers and the read pointer. And that is a measure of what you call as a lag. So then you manually restart the container. So it works in most cases. And uh, when there is some sustained back pressure due to GCs and everything, uh, so we do uh, restart that particular container. Then uh, sometimes users prefer uh, dropping data, so they care about the data. And we also use uh, heron topologies and everything to detect bad holes, which in turn feedbacks, like detect stragglers and take the nodes out. So that is a separate heron topology too. So I think uh, I'm pretty much done. The one thing about is for heron resource usage, uh, one thing that takeaway I want to give is this is an experiment that we did. And um, so we, for the whole experiment, we took around 30 to 50 cores. One of the insight is 84% of the cores is goes into spouts. Like uh, if you take the topology, most of the cost goes into the spouts. Why? Because uh, if you break down the cost of the spout, 63% of the core usage is mainly for deserializing data. Like you take the data out of a Kafka, then uh, if it is in thrift format, you deserialize the thrift format or a protobuf format, whatever the format that you have. The reason why people use serialization, deserialization is because your data schemas are continuously changing because people want to add attribute, another attribute, this here. So which means how do you deal with the older data? So in order to uh, keep, make sure that uh, your schema is compatible, we do this uh, serialization, deserialization, and that is the expensive cost. And the next expensive cost is fetching out of Kafka, which is around 25% of the cost goes there itself. Then, um, so then the, the bolt is even though the again 68% goes into deserialization, writing into the Redis, but uh, again the overall bolt cost is not the same. So in the whole uh, this thing, the fetching oper data operations out of the uh, what do you call the Kafka or Kestrel or whatever the data sources. That is the expensive part, whereas the heron part is just a noise, like 11%. We can even make it another 4x efficient, but uh, when most of the inefficiency is in the other systems, until we become a bigger part of the whole pie, then only we want to kind of improve it further. So if you want to learn more about it, we 
have published three papers and um, then there is a tutorial on real-time analytics that we did then um, if you're interested in Deren it's all open source it's in uh, herenstreaming.io there's a huge amount of documentation that uh, you can think about it and it's Heron is getting into production into a lot of big companies including Microsoft uh, Alibaba and Boidu WeChat and uh, some of the companies working with under NDA they're all getting into production because of the scale and the reliability and if you wanted to know about what's going on you can follow us at Heron streaming that's all I had thank you thanks for listening if thank you have you any questions thank you Kardik uh, if you have any questions you can ask him right now yes one at a time so the the deserializing uh, operation itself involves uh, what do you call it? there are two aspects to that one is how deep the nested data is so if it's a flat schema then it's reasonably faster but uh, one of the things that uh, causes is our data is uh, heavily nested like uh, probably like uh, seven to eight levels of nesting that is one of the cost for it yes okay yeah, yeah sure okay so I think like if you have any questions you can do an offline because you have another talk so thank you